I admit that in America, I saw more than America. I looked there for an image of democracy itself, its inclinations, its character, its prejudices, and its passions. I wanted to get to know it, if only to know at least what we must hope or fear from it. So wrote Alexa de Tocqueville in Democracy in America, a book that we will turn attention to for the rest of this semester. This uh, set of travel notes from a French visitor who came to the United States in 1831 and wrote down everything he saw and gives us a really fascinating record of life in the United States in that era. But as we'll see, a lot of things that have not changed and probably will never change. This was the moment that Americans became Americans. This is the first generation of Americans who don't remember the founding. Remember, this is about the same time that uh, Abraham Lincoln gave his Lyceum address, 1838. And that's exactly what he says, that the founding generation is gone. We're on our own now. So who are we? How do we sustain what we have been given by our ancestors? This is when Tocqueville arrived in the United States. He arrived specifically in May of 1831 and uh, right away went to work taking notes, visiting all kinds of civic events and religious events, interviewing hundreds of Americans, sitting down, visiting people in their homes, having focus group discussions, and just asking them all kinds of questions and taking tons and tons and tons of notes. In addition to Democracy in America, we actually have his notebooks too, where he has all these meticulous observations and what people said in answer to this or that question. So he was a heck of a researcher. He also spent quite a bit of time in American archives, digging through old laws and old historical documents, visiting libraries. And so he just absorbed everything, everything Americans were in this moment and really showed who we were at the moment that we crystallized into our current uh, state and everything we will probably always be, as we'll see. Yeah, there's a lot of twists and turns in American history since then. But on the, at the bottom of it, we are pretty much the same people we were when Tocqueville described us here. The same qualities, the same virtues, the same faults, the same dangers. When he says democracy, as you can tell, he means a whole lot more than just a political system. You'll be glad to know if you're a little burned out on the politics. Uh, it has much more to do with society, the way Americans think, the way they talk, the way they educate their kids, the way they get married, the way that they think about high culture and what's beautiful and excellent, the way they think of themselves and the deepest parts of their souls. It turns out democracy in America, Tocqueville says, means way, way more than just politics. So we'll consider that. Like I said, he arrived in 1831 uh, in New England and right away started touring that part of the country in the Northeast, spent a lot of time in upstate New York, which was a pretty exciting place at that time. You saw the Erie Canal under construction. You saw all these boom towns. Uh, it really looked like upstate New York would be the future. He went up to French speaking part of Quebec and then back down again and then went out west and went to the frontier town of Milwaukee in Green Bay, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Wisconsin wasn't yet a state, uh, but it was federal territory and there were these big towns out there. And so he saw pretty clearly that the American West really was going to be the future. So what would that future be? How was it that frontier settlers would come to shape the character of the nation? What did it mean for Native Americans? He has a whole section about them, as we'll see. Went south, traveled through um, Ohio and then down through Kentucky, a little bit of the Mississippi River down into New Orleans, back among French speakers, right? And then went up through the deep south, across Georgia, Carolinas, Virginia, and then finally in Washington, D.C., where he spent quite a bit of time in the nation's capital. Here's where he did a lot of archival work, and he observed sessions of Congress, met with the president, and then in uh, February of 1832, got on a boat and went back to France. And he would never return. It was one fairly quick visit to the United States. Uh, but it seems he just absorbed everything there. He traveled with a friend of his and a, a personal secretary, Gustave de Beaumont, and uh, helped him collect all the information and data. And what's funny is the original reason he came was not to do any of this. The French government actually paid for this trip so that he would come to the United States and study the prison system. So you'll see, he does mention here and there in the book things about criminal justice and prisons and whatnot. 
But uh, that's only a small part of what his job really was. Um, it really was to write this classic book uh, about America, but more broadly about democracy, as we'll see, and what democracy means, not just right here in the United States, but what it means for the world. While here, he interviewed, like we said, hundreds of Americans, mostly ordinary people. Focus group discussions, he would stay in people's homes. But while he was in D.C., he also met some famous ones, too. People like Daniel Webster, the famous senator from Massachusetts. And that day, people would come to D.C. just to hear Webster give a speech. He was that dazzling on the floor of the U.S. Senate. He would meet former President John Quincy Adams, recently defeated by Andrew Jackson in the election of 1828. And Adams really represented the last of the old founding generation of presidents. His dad was, of course, John Adams, the American founder, vice president, second president of the United States, really in with George Washington and Jefferson and that whole gang. And so uh, John Quincy Adams uh, was sort of the last representative of that old way of American identity. What did he have to say? Certainly some very interesting things to Tocqueville, this inquisitive Frenchman. He also met Sam Houston, prominent politician in Texas, soon to be senator from Texas, known for his eccentric style, wearing his outfits on the floor of the Senate and his wide brim hat. Um, and so once again, looking at Texas, looking at the West, Tocqueville really could see the shape of the character of, of the nation, not just geographically, but um, in everything it was. And of course, he met President Andrew Jackson. Jackson was a wild man. We've touched on him before, but what was different about him in contrast with other presidents? He was the first president to come from West of the Appalachian Mountains. He was not part of the old Virginia aristocracy where all the other presidents had come from, except, of course, for the Adamses, who came from Massachusetts. They were all just East Coast elitist snobs. Who was Jackson? He was every man's president. He was the common man's hero. He spoke with a crass Southern dialect. He was known for being a rough and tumble gambler and dueler. Not a you know, gambler and dueler. He just seemed to embody all the worst character traits in the American way. And yet here he was in the White House and he came into office in uh, uh, 1829 and uh, his presidency had been well underway. Uh, we'd seen Cherokee removal. Tocqueville will talk about that. In fact, he witnessed it personally. And uh, he really would look at Jackson as just, you know, the, the bottom lowest common denominator of American life. Um, but somehow this, is, this was the point where Tocqueville's advice really came in. How do we train democracy? How do we make the best of it? How do we keep the Andrew Jacksons of the world from becoming full-on demagogues like we saw back in, in classical times? As Plato observed, every democracy devolves into tyranny. Jackson seemed to be that tyrant. And yet, did we fall into tyranny? No. Jackson would leave office at the end of his second term. And the presidency and the nation would just sort of carry on. Why, Tocqueville said, why do Americans get a free pass when it comes to these aspects of political theory? I want to know that, he said. And that's the major point of his book. Traveler notes were common. Probably one of the most famous ones was Frances Trollope, an English woman who came to the United States and lived here for a few years in the 1820s and 30s, and then wrote her famous little book, Domestic Manners of the Americans. And the, the news was not very good. Americans talk of their glory, she wrote, while they drink mint julep and chew tobacco. A lot of tobacco chewing going on then. And they would swear by the beard of Jupiter that they are very graceful and agreeable. And moreover, uh, they, are, they are graceful and agreeable. And moreover, they would abuse anyone who did not cry out, amen. I'm out of here, said Trollope. Went back to Europe and her book was widely read with great interest. And people said, oh, America, yuck. Why would I ever go there? Tocqueville decided early on that he was not going to be like that. Trollope was just the best known one. There were several other critics that were really, really harsh about the United States. He definitely had plenty to criticize. There were things he didn't like about the United States at all, being very European himself. They lacked manners. <laughs> yeah, the tobacco spitting was pretty obnoxious. They were crass. They were obnoxious and vulgar. They just seemed like a bunch of peasants who had somehow figured out free government. Yeah, I see it all, said Tocqueville. However, there's one major catch. Democracy in America is soon going to be the democracy we see all over the world. Love it or hate it, it's coming. 
it's coming to France, it's coming to Britain and Germany and all of Europe, and maybe eastern parts of the world and Africa and the Middle East too. How do you train democracy? You can criticize democratic ways of life all you want, Trollope, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to learn to make the best of it because there's no avoiding it. So he was a friend to America. He was a friend to American democracy, but he was the best kind of friend you can get, a cautious friend, a friend who doesn't let you get away with your nonsense, but tries to show you how to make the best use of what you've got. What is this book? What, what is Tocqueville exactly? He's hard to pin down. Is he a historian? Well, as we'll see, he talks about some history, uh, especially in the next chapter, um, the second chapter. Uh, he talks quite, quite a bit about the early days of colonial settlement, which he thinks is the true founding. So Washington, Jefferson, and Adams and the revolution, that was all great, but Tocqueville says, but those weren't the real founders. The real founders, as we'll see, were the Puritans in New England. We'll get to that. So yeah, sort of a historian, but he does more than history. Was he a travel journalist? Kind of like Trollope was. Yeah, uh, he does have a lot to say about the landscape, about curiosities and interesting and funny things Americans do. He relays some of his conversations, and they're quite humorous, as we'll see. But is he just a journalist? This isn't a series of articles he wrote. This is a big old book. Is he a sociologist? A lot of times sociologists will claim him as their own. The way that he sort of observes things in this detached kind of way and deduces cause and effect. Uh, he does sort of read very much like what we call a sociologist today. And yet he's more than just a social scientist. He's not concerned just about cause and effect and you know social forces, but more deeply, where are they leading? He makes some predictions. He sounds prophetic sometimes, and sometimes he's also called a futurist, about where American democracy is headed. We'll see some of those predictions. He didn't get all of them right. Some, though, he got very right. He'll be absolutely stunned at some of how true some of his predictions become. Others might still come true. We're still waiting to see. So we'll see some of his prophetic or futurist predictions. Is he a political philosopher in the style of Aristotle, Plato, Cicero, John, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, that whole gang? He's often grouped together with them. But... He's not purely speculative because, again, he's also got his sociological element. He's got his historical element. So he does some political philosophy of what democracy is, uh, but he ties it together with so many other things. Is he all of the above? That seems to be the best way to describe him. It's a wonderful book because it just defies categories. There's something in Tocqueville for everyone, as you will see. So if Certain parts of the book don't seem particularly interesting to you. Other parts will. And I think, too, you will see how much of what he says relates to your field of study here at University of Mary, to your particular interests as a person. He's really quite wonderful uh, to read and a great way to get a real snapshot on not just what democracy is and what self-government is, but how to maintain it, how to be a responsible citizen in the noblest and most exceptional sense. The book I signed was the Hackett edition of Democracy in America. It is abridged. The full volume is huge. It's like 500 pages. This one is, of course, quite a bit shorter. The editors cut out a lot of things. Plus, follow the syllabus, and you'll see that I cut out things even in this volume, just in the interest of time. He does tend to repeat himself sometimes, so I cut out the parts that are that repeat so we stick to you know what he really has to say. I will uh, fill in certain chapters, things that we miss, just to give a shout out to what's being said there and why it's important. Um, but yeah, stick to it. Don't feel bad if you don't follow everything he says. He does get uh, you know pretty speculative once in a while, but just roll with it. Stick with what you do understand. Stick with what you do know. And as far as the quizzes go, I will be really specific about you know which chapter and um, what's coming up. I'll make the quizzes a bit longer than they've been, so you can really kind of think about them carefully as we go. Um, I will also have some reading questions that will not be due. You don't have to turn them in, but you can just refer to them as you read, just to give you a roadmap through what you're reading in each chapter. So with that, I'm thrilled to study this wonderful book with all of you, and we will turn to Democracy in America. Page one. Among the new objects that attracted my attention during my stay in the United States, None struck me with greater force than the equality of conditions. I easily perceived the enormous influence that this primary fact exercises 
on the workings of democracy. Um, sorry, society, I meant to say. It gives a particular direction to the public mind, a peculiar turn to the laws, new maxims to those who govern, and particular habits to the governed. But there's more, he says. I soon realized that this same fact, this equality of conditions, extends its influence far beyond political mores and laws, and that its empire extends over civil society as well as government. This is more than just political science he's doing here, right? It creates opinions. It gives rise to sentiments. It inspires customs. And this equality modifies everything that it did not produce. Equality of conditions is the major feature of a democratic society. Democracy is all about equality. Remember, we saw that with Plato. And you see it saturate everything here in the United States. Not just politics, not just government and institutions, but all aspects of society. In this way, he said, I studied American society, and I saw more and more in the equality of conditions, the generative fact from which every particular fact seemed to flow. And I kept finding that fact before me again and again as a central point to which all my observations were tending. So equality of conditions everywhere and shaping every aspect of American life. And right away you say, but wait, slavery, right? How do you square that? Well, as you'll have a lot to say about slavery, as well as treatment of Native Americans, as well as women, everybody who's kind of shut out of this growth toward equality, he fully acknowledges in this book, and he criticizes Americans pretty harshly for that. However, this is way more equality than we've ever seen before in the old world, Tocqueville points out in the introduction. Consider the history. So here you see Tocqueville turn very historical. What are the origins of Western democracy? Of course, you've got ancient Athens and all of that, which we talked about earlier, but in, at least in modern times, he says, we're, you know, since the ancient, ancient world, where do you see the birth of democracy? It comes from a very interesting place. Wind the clock back 700 years, he says, to the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages? What could be more undemocratic than that? It was a very rigid social hierarchy. Here you have one of the few depictions of the three major classes of medieval Europe. You can tell who they are, right? Who's the guy with the shovel? He's a peasant. Those who work, as they said in the Middle Ages. Who's the guy on the opposite side with the funny haircut? He's a church man. He's a monk. And that he represents the church. And in the middle, you've got the lord, the feudal aristocracy. They would have been called lords then. Known by his suit of armor his coat of arms, his sense of dignity, his honor. He's a knight. When he grows older, he'll become a feudal lord or a baron or whatever. Um, and also the king at the top. Those are the three classes. Those who work, those who pray, those who fight would have been the common term. And through much of the Middle Ages, no one seemed to think that there was anything unusual about this. The lords and the dukes and the knights live in their castles and the common folk work the land. And they work out a deal between them to just keep things that way. And in the minds of people in the Middle Ages, you could never do anything different than this. This was just the way to order society. It was called aristocracy. Aristoi in Greek means the best, so it's the rule of the best. We use that term today to mean the rich, but that's not exactly what it meant in the Middle Ages, and Tocqueville will explain that. Uh, aristocrats were usually pretty rich, yeah. They lived in castles and they had suits of armor, but they could also be very poor and still be aristocrats. Peasants, though, they were always in their condition, at least in the early part of the Middle Ages. So what happened? How was it that this great democratic revolution, Tocqueville says, started here? I mean, how in the world could a society that was as rigid as that, right, where everybody just kind of found their place in that layered cake of civil society, the king at the top, peasants at the bottom, and then, you know, knights, the middle part, uh, the lower middle part, and then the lords in the second middle part, the church off to the side because they do their own thing. How do you get democracy out of that? How do you get equality out of something like that? It's so unequal, it seemed. Well, as he points out, 
the cracks started to show early on. What was the first one? It was the church, of course. Imagine you're a feudal lord and you go to mass on Sunday morning and you sit in the front row in your fine clothes and you sit with members of your own class because behind you is where all the peasants sit. But that priest gets up and preaches what? Social equality before God. Maybe not in this world, maybe not right now, and maybe God ordains that some people be superior to others in this life for, for his glory, for whatever reason. But at the last judgment, when you stand before the throne of Christ, you will all be equal. Imagine hearing that if you're so convinced of your own superiority as a feudal lord. But that's the truth. That's what the church preaches. The clergy, Tocqueville points out, middle of page two, opened their ranks to all. Anybody could become a priest. Anybody could join a monastic order. It didn't matter what class you were. And the abbot in the, in the monastery would have no tolerance for guys claiming their superiority over others because they came from noble families. Nope. All are equal before God. All are equal. So the church uh, introduces a lot more democracy than the world at the time ever knew. And if it weren't for them, it might never have gotten going the way that it did. But there were other things. He mentioned civil laws. And the fact that uh, increasingly, especially in England, where you saw civil laws increasingly concerned with justice and fairness, regardless of what class you came from, hearings and trials and a jury of your peers might have started with the, the aristocrats back in Magna Carta. But over time, it started to include all classes of people. Law itself started to see man as man and had less and less regard for who was part of a noble class and who wasn't. What else, though? As the Middle Ages progressed, more and more often you would see peasants who would live their lives working the fields for the feudal lords on the manor, right? And they, they were not, not exactly slaves, but still they were bound to the land in such a way, and they couldn't just leave. But increasingly they would, and they would run away to the towns, and they would turn away from just agricultural backbreaking work for the feudal lord and turn instead to, bottom of page two, commerce, business, trade. Towns became these industrial centers where people could find manufacturing skills and make a lot of money. Meanwhile, the feudal lord says, hey, where are all my peasants going, <laughs> right? And so he rides into town in his suit of armor on his horse to collect runaway peasants only to be greeted by a bunch of townspeople. And they've all got clubs and pitchforks. Guess it's time to let the peasants go. Better keep a tighter ship on the manor, right? Uh, the rule in the Middle Ages was if you could run away from your lord for a year and a day, you were officially free. And so people would hide out in the towns for a year and a day, learn some skill, learn some marketable trade, and suddenly find themselves richer than the Lord was, because the Lord is off fighting other families and fighting on horseback, maybe running off to fight the Crusades or whatever, and he's just driving himself broke. Meanwhile, the peasant who ran away is getting rich. One day, the knight takes a look at that suit of armor and realizes it's pretty rusty, and the castle is looking pretty shabby, and the walls look like they're going to buckle and fall down. He doesn't know how to fix it, and so he sheepishly comes into the town <laughs> and approaches the blacksmith turns out to be it was his former peasant, his former serf. Now what's the deal between the, the aristocrats and the common people? The aristocrats become more and more dependent on the market. You still see traces of this in Europe today. The town square in medieval towns where you have like the old clock tower and these buildings going clear back to like 13th century. They really were the hubs of commerce and growth. And so Tocqueville says... Little by little, enlightenment spreads, and the taste for literature and the arts is awakened, right? Not just among the leisured aristocratic classes, but all classes. The mind, had been, the mind then becomes an element of success. Knowledge is a means of government. Intelligence is social force. The learned come to take part in public affairs, page three. So, things are changing. Urban centers are starting to become the real hub of enlightenment. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, the knowledge that is locked up in monasteries starts to become more and more public. We're still a ways away from the printing press at this point, but still, learning practical skills 
as well as theoretical knowledge is growing. These are all, Tocqueville says, steps toward democracy. But then the last and uh, the second to last and most important one had to do with the guy at the top of the feudal aristocracy, the king. Kings increasingly start to look to the common peasants, to the common people, especially the ones living in the towns, as just as important and in some ways more important to his royal authority than nobles. Because nobles, what do they care about? The kingdom? No, they care about themselves. They care about their class and their privilege, their detachment from the common people, their honor. The kingdom? That's nah, a king's business. They don't really care. Kings and nobles have a hard time getting along through much of medieval history. But kings have some leverage against the nobles. He says on page three, still more often the kings cause the inferior classes of the state to participate in the government in order to pull down the aristocracy. Not always, but when it doesn't behave, kings very often turn against nobles. What else does he mention? The rise of private property, notions of property rights, and finally, he says in Psalm page four, when one searches through the pages of our history in the last 700 years, one comes across almost no great events during the last, last 700 years that did not turn to the profit of equality. He mentions a miscellany of other things, free municipalities, those medieval townships, uh, very interesting one on page four, firearms equalizes the commoner and the noble, doesn't matter how good that knight is with his sword and lance. When the peasants have guns, <laughs> everything changes. The earliest guns to make their way from the Far East were the arquebus, kind of almost like a rocket launcher you put on your shoulder, but, but, but eventually the musket was developed. And this was a great game changer. It's funny, we think of the right to keep and bear arms in the Second Amendment as a civil liberty, as a, a matter of personal privacy. But no, historically, it was more of a civil right. It was a great equalizer, gunpowder was. He mentions the rise of the post office, the in interconnectedness of information. He mentions Protestant Christianity as playing an important role in this too. He also have a lot to say about religion later. Uh, he himself is a French Catholic, but he says that Protestantism, uh, at least historically, has a very important role in this process. We'll meet, we'll meet the Puritans next time. So, if in the beginning of the 11th century, he says on page five, you examine what is happening in France every 50 years, at the end of each of these periods, you will not fail to notice what he calls the double revolution between Lord and Serf. What's happening? The noble, the guy in the fine red robes there with his house and his honor and his castle and his horses and his suit of armor and all that, he descends down. The Serf, meanwhile, who worked out this deal with his feudal lord to work the land and all of that, suddenly finds himself rising. And what is about to happen? Each half century brings them nearer to each other. And soon they will touch. Soon they will meet. Things will be more mixed up and less hierarchical. So it's not so much that aristocracy goes away. It's more that it gets absorbed and neutralized by the rise of democracy. And this is not just particular to France, he says, where he comes from. In whatever direction we cast our glance, we perceive the same revolution continuing throughout the entire Christian world. Democracy is coming. It is a force of history. Even those who fight against it, even those who think it's impossible, who think it'll just collapse, it's just a delusion, whatever, even they end up working for the coming of democracy. Pell-mell in the same direction, he says on page five, with all goes, they all work in concert, almost as if all people are blind instruments in the hands of God, he says. This is the will of God that democracy come. It's like the way God moves the planets. He doesn't have to shout it. <laughs> it just happens as a matter of his will, Tocqueville says on page six. So too, the coming of democracy in this transition it's not just in America, it's going to be everywhere. It's hard to explain what's happening, Tocqueville says, because we have no comparison. When has something like this ever happened before? What I see, this entire book you are going to read, was written under the impression of a sort of religious terror produced in the soul of the author 
by the sight of this irresistible revolution that has advanced so many centuries through all obstacles and that one still sees advancing today in the midst of the ruins it has made as a matter of God's will, as an unstoppable force of human history. So, what's to be done? Well, first of all, has Tocqueville been right about this? It took a while, but yeah. Political scientists who study global development of democracy point out it seems to be winning. It had some major setbacks. Sorry, the print is a little small, but that's World War I. You see the first sort of stagnation. And then right after World War I, it spikes. More countries around the world adopt democratic institutions and practices and grant the right to vote and turn to legislatures instead of aristocracies. There was a major dip, of course, um, between the world wars, and you saw the rise of, of Nazism and fascism in Europe. So yeah, it went back down again. But once World War II was over, what happened? It bounces back up. And pretty soon it falls everywhere. It, it, it uh, is all over, the, all over the place. And then with the fall of communism, it looks like democracy has won the day. It's inevitable. Even today, look around the world, right? There are some holdouts, of course. There are some countries that are very undemocratic. Russia, China, right? Central Asian countries, certain African countries, Venezuela, Cuba. Um, but still, if you add up all the others, it's hard to tell with the map, but if you add up all the others, democracy really is emerging very triumphant. Now, is this always good news? As Tocqueville points out, no. It's not always great when democracy comes because you have to make the best of democracy. He says on page six toward the bottom, to instruct this democracy, to reinvigorate, if possible, its beliefs, to purify its morals, to regulate its movements, to substitute little by little the science of public affairs for its, for its inexperience, the knowledge of its true interests for its blind instincts, to adapt its government to times and places, to modify it according to circumstances and men. Such is the first of the duties imposed in our time upon those who direct society. And so his famous words, a new political science is necessary for a wholly new world. Wow, what an observation. And he hopes that this book, he says very plainly, this book will be read by politicians, by ordinary citizens, by everybody who can learn to do exactly what I titled this section, train your democracy, make the best of it, because it can go really bad. Consider recent history in France. King Louis XIV of France really embraced the notion of absolute royal power. He was called the Sun King, and he uh, listened to his top advisors and really embodied what Thomas Hobbes taught. Remember the Leviathan? The fact that the state is everything, that people live in fundamental mortal fear of each other, and so that's why they all need to fear you as the king. Uh, and that's how you forge a national unity out of people. So that meant nobles, step aside. He famously called all French nobles to come live in his massive palace outside of Paris called Versailles uh, to try to keep them under control and put himself at the absolute center of the whole nation. And he succeeded. He really pulled it off quite well. He invested a great deal in developing his country, uh, developing the military, developing the administration, and also doing a lot of good for his people through education. You saw the rise of the royal academies across France that would train people in enlightenment science and all the best wisdom of the past, as well as the most cutting edge enlightenment uh, in, uh, science and knowledge that had been gained in recent years. And so, yeah, Louis did a whole lot to try to make France as much of a modern state as it could possibly be. And he succeeded. He passed the crown to his son, Louis XV, who reigned uh, briefly um, and wasn't very impressive. He was much more of a partier. But then everything changed for Louis XVI, the grandson, as we know. And he was not quite up for the task that he was entrusted with. Married off to Marie Antoinette, uh, a um, princess from you know, Austria over the border, uniting the two kingdoms through this royal household. But everything that the grandfather had set in motion in France kind of boiled over as King Louis came to the throne. He and Marie lived their lives locked away in the Palace of Versailles. There it is. 
uh, and it became really quite detached from what was going on outside. As you saw the peasants, the common folk of France, gaining more and more self-consciousness of who they were, and they came to call themselves the Third Estate, famous political cartoon of the priest and the noble riding the back of the peasant, carrying the burden of France. And it was true, uh, priests and nobles were tax exempt, right? Who paid all the taxes? The working classes who were already kind of poor. This is a really volatile, dangerous system. And so, yeah, these peasants become much more self-conscious of themselves, much more aware of how downtrodden they are because of the system. Well, we all know where this leads, the French Revolution. As the third estate asserts itself, as uh, King Louis calls what's called the Estates General, the three estates to come, the representatives of each part, and the peasants showed up and the door was locked. Turns out many years later, it was an accident. <laughs> Still, though, they went across the way to the famous tennis court oath, where all the members of the third estate, which included a lot of members of the church, you see the monk there, took this oath to each other to band together into something like the general will. A lot of this was very inspired by Rousseau. Remember him? How did things go with the third estate? They uh, soon turned to a lot of hostile tactics against the regime. The first major step was the storming of the Bastille in Paris, this old military fort where all the armory had been stored and a whole bunch of gunpowder. And the troops just couldn't hold off the mob. And so they broke down the gate and just pulled all the weapons out. And so now you've got armed mobs in Paris. Well, King Louis, to his credit, right away told the new National Assembly that was formed by the Third Estate, all right, let's talk. And so the king actually showed up to meet the Third Estate and to say, what, you know, what concessions do you want? How can we work together? And it seemed for a while as if the king was going to work with them. But then he made one fatal mistake. He and Marie Antoinette and their children made a run for the border. They tried to get over to Austria. Why? It was suspected, and it was very likely, that he was going to get the Austrian army rallied up and march back on Paris, put him back on the throne, and shut down this revolution. And just as he was about to leave, he was caught and returned to Paris, put on trial for high treason against the people of France. And as we know executed on the guillotine soon after. And thus began what was called the Reign of Terror, where you had thousands of people, guillotine, went to their deaths. First the nobles, members of the church, but then pretty soon even members of the revolution themselves. The ringleader of all of this was Maximilien Robespierre, and he oversaw what was called the Terror, in the belief that this violent, bloody action of chopping people's heads off systematically with the guillotine could, on one hand, get rid of political enemies of the state and also kind of soften people's minds up with the violence, kind of show them we meant it when we talked about forming a, re a revolutionary republic to make democracy electrified in France. It would take some bloodshed. Well, as we know, Robespierre himself eventually went to the guillotine. He was the last one guillotined in the terror, uh, even though he'd been the ringleader. As he started accusing members of the National Assembly of treason, they finally turned on him, and that was the end of Robespierre. What a mess. And it wasn't over for France either, especially as we saw the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, who declared himself emperor, who pretty much scrapped all the democratic aspirations of the French Revolution and turned France into a country entirely centered on himself, and then stomped all over Europe and across North Africa, overthrew the post-revolutionary government called the Directory that only ruled for about five years, and declared himself the new Holy Roman Emperor. Well, Robespierre, uh, sorry, where, where, well, uh, Napoleon was eventually overthrown, thankfully, by um, the allies led by Britain and Austria and others, but what happened with France post-Napoleon? The big administrative government there just never really went away. And so as a result, Tocqueville says, what do we see happen in France? It goes from democratic chaos to tyranny of Napoleon to bureaucracy. Bureaucracy meaning large administrative state that regulates every aspect of French life, 
and France just kind of settles down into a stale, uh, dull democratic system. As we know, over time, it does reinvigorate itself, and France today is a pretty vibrant democracy, but wow, what a hard road to take. Why wasn't it more like the way it went in America? Tocqueville's central question, thinking about his homeland of France and the United States that he is visiting in this book, he's wondering, if democracy is inevitable, how do you keep it from going badly? And how do you help it go well? Why was it such a mess in France and such a success in the United States? What did we do? Was there a terror in the U.S.? No, Americans quietly drafted a constitution, submitted it to the people for ratification, and off we went. No problem. France just could never seem to do something like that. Why? That's the question he means to ask here. That's what he really wants to know um, about what makes America work. And so he turns to democratic times. What do you have to say? Page eight, page nine. I want to approach this, he says, with reason and calm sentiment and see how Americans were able to control their passions as they made the transition to democracy. What's the general snapshot of what American democracy is like? He says on page nine, I understand that in the democratic state constituted in this manner, the society will not be immobile, but the movements of the social body will be able to be regulated and progressive. If one encounters less brilliance, aristocracy has gone, right? Where's, where's nobility? Where's honor? It's okay. One also finds less misery. Uh, pleasures will be less extreme, but well-being will be more general. Americans like luxury, but they don't overdo it. They're not as opulent as old world aristocracy was. Sciences will be less grand, but at the same time, ignorance will be rarer. He'll observe later that Americans are highly literate. Our literacy rates are extremely high, but nobody really reads anything, <laughs> at least nothing important, he says, unless you're in college like you guys, right? But Feelings will be less energetic, but habits will be milder. One will notice there are more vices, but also fewer crimes. So, what an interesting view that we have this dawn of mediocrity, the high and the low, the aristocracy and the peasants come together to form American life in a very unusual way. It's not great, but wow, it's way better than what the French went through, isn't it? So maybe we could learn from the Americans and learn to see exactly what they did right, what worked so well for them. Why couldn't France follow this example? Why couldn't France follow it now? Maybe they could, and maybe every other country who reads this book. So it's a fascinating, great book, but at the same time, it's also kind of a how-to manual, how to train democracy, right? How to make the very best of it. He's very critical of his homeland, as you'll see. They've lost a lot of their Christian faith after the revolution. That's quite true. I mean, uh, a lot of Western Europe really never recovers from the Enlightenment, from the revolutionary era. They are all about liberty, but they seem to think that it comes at the expense of religion. They seem to think liberty stands on its own, that liberalism doesn't require any kind of moral framework. What a mistake, Tocqueville says. Americans know better. Of course it requires a moral framework. And if you take that away, Liberalism just kind of collapses on itself, and you end up with this really kind of anti-human tendency. That, he says, is not God's intent on page 12. Will I think that the creator made man in order to leave him to wrestle with himself endlessly in the midst of intellectual miseries that surround us? I cannot believe it. God is preparing for European societies a more stable and calmer future. I am ignorant of God's designs, but I will not cease to believe in them because I cannot penetrate them, and I will prefer to doubt my own lights rather than God's justice. There is a country in the world, thankfully, he says, America, where the great social revolution I am speaking of seems to have almost reached its natural limits. There it has taken place in a simple and easy manner. Not violent upheavals, not turmoil, not vast bureaucratic regulation. But instead, we just make it work. We take democracy as it's coming at the world, and Americans make the best of it. There is uh, there, uh, there in America, he says at the bottom, 
of that next paragraph, it was able to grow in liberty and marching forward with mores to develop peacefully within the laws. France should copy America, he says. France should take some lessons from what the United States did. This is the purpose of this book, he says. It is not only in order to satisfy curiosity, right? Plenty of books written about that already. No, instead, I wanted to find lessons there from which we in France and everywhere else might profit. It would be a strange mistake to think that I wanted to write a panegyric. Whoever reads this book will be quite well convinced that such was not my design. Nor was my goal to extol such a form of government in general, because I am among those who believe that there is almost never absolute goodness in laws. Nope, all I'm doing is showing the American example. How is it that they manage this tsunami of democracy so well, while other countries are going to struggle like France did? Let's follow the American example. So he explains his book. What are his sources? He tells you, just ordinary Americans. They tend to be a lot more candid when you're sitting in front of their fireplace, right? <laughs> than if you, uh, you know, approach them on the street or in some formal occasion. And so he did. He stayed with Americans, like we said, and he listened to them. He has uh, reams and reams of notes. And of course, his good friend Gustav de Beaumont was there also taking notes as a researcher. Um, he, met, he says, I met famous men and common men. I, uh, a lot more common Americans. He thought they were more important than the famous ones were. Uh, he has, he divides the book into two major parts, as you can tell, and he mentions those. The first part deals a little bit more with the political aspect of democracy in America, what this means for um, active participation of citizens, what it means for government, what it means for elected officials, what it means for institutions like religion and free associations. He'll have a lot to say about clubs and organizations that are very important for him. The second part, though, he turns more to the more intimate aspects of American life, where he talks about how Americans think, the philosophic method, as he calls it, um, how Americans talk, say about American English, literature and philosophy, uh, and a lot more about religion. He's really fascinated with American religion. American manners, or lack thereof, <laughs> the fact that we tend to be pretty crass and obnoxious people. What do foreigners think of Americans? What are Americans like in France? He'll mention that briefly. But then he'll have some really pressing things to say about the future. What are the dangers of democracy that are dangers everywhere, but that Americans have managed well? But also, how might we lose our ability to manage them well? How might we train our democracy in the future and be responsible citizens in the most important ways? So with that, Let's turn to democracy in America. Next time we'll look at uh, uh, volume one, part one, chapter two. So he goes like parts and volumes, but just follow the page numbers and you'll be fine on the uh, on syllabus. And uh, yeah, let's talk about what he calls the origins of American democracy. So in this part, he looked at the origins back in the Middle Ages, but here he talks about colonial America and he pays particular attention to the Puritans. So let's look at Puritan New England and the origins of American democracy next time. See you then.